over the past 26 days of national lockdown, we have special discussions with leading doctors and healthcare experts to bring guidance and tips for patients living with cancer, various chronic diseases, people who are facing mental health issues, and pregnant women. Today's session will discuss about the special needs of patients with chronic kidney diseases. India has over 10 crores of patients suffering from kidney-related conditions. This is an estimation, and this staggering number makes it very critical to ensure that they do not miss out on special health support they need due to lockdowns. We have a very special panel of top kidney care experts today with us who hail from different parts of this country and top-notch hospitals across the nation. I would like to welcome our panel of experts today, Dr. Professor A.K. Bhalla, Senior Consultant and Chairman, Department of Nephrology, Sir Gangaram Hospitals, New Delhi. Dr. Raka Kaushal, Director, Nephrology and Kidney Transplant, IV Hospital, Mohali. Dr. Sampath Kumar, Senior Consultant and HOD Nephrology, Minakshi Mission Hospital and Research Center. Dr. Sishir Gang, Chairman, Department of Nephrology, Mauji Bhai Patel, Urology Hospital. Dr. Tarun Jaloka, Director, Nephrology, Aditya Birla Memorial Hospital, Pune. Dr. Lalit K. Agrawal, Senior Nephrologist, Woodlands Multi Specialty Hospital. Dr. Ram Mohan Bhatt, Consultant, Nephrologist, Majumdar Shaw Medical Center, Narayan Health City, Bangalore, and Dr. Pankaj Hans, Head of Department, Nephrology, Ruben Memorial Hospital, and Associate Professor, PMCH Patna. We also have Dr. Santos Varughese, Professor and Head of Department of Nephrology, Christ Christian Medical College, Velour. Dr. Narayan Prasad, Professor, Department of Nephrology, Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. Dr. Mehul A. Saad, Consultant Pediatric Nephrologist, Apollo Health City Hospital, Hyderabad. And Dr. Nitish Kumar Mohanty, Senior Consultant and Head Nephrology, Apollo Hospital, Bhuneswar. We have also have Dr. Tarun Kumar Saha. The session will be moderated by Dr. Bobby John, eminent public health expert and co-founder of ISW Council. So over to you, Bobby, to take this discussion forward. Kamal, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone of our experts and uh, esteemed panelists to spare your time to be part of this conversation. This country, as many countries are around this world, under shutdown conditions. We're calling them as COVID-related lockdown measures. We can have these as administrative and public health measures, but when we come to the human body, lockdowns are next to impossible. And if they do happen, they indicate serious difficulties, especially with organ systems like the kidney, as and when they do decide that they are not going to function, go into shutdown, those are not very happy situations for individuals or the people that are taking care of them. And the journey towards such a uh, shutdown situation is to be both avoided, picked up very early and managed so that we are not in trouble. And as and when that does happen, unfortunately, in many, many people, there are many things that then need to be taken care of all at the same time. It's no longer the individual alone who's um, in the situation. It is the family. It is also the caregiving community, starting from the nephrologist down to the person who also is part of the dialysis team. It becomes a multi-factor team work that comes into play to enable people to continue their lives. It's also perhaps a metaphor for the times that we are currently living through. This country, as are many countries, are under lockdown. How we come out of it, how we gradually make our way out of it, is also going to be as tricky as enabling people with kidney disease coming out of their own uh, failure or shutdown situations and coming back to good health. 
Thank you all for making your time and being available experts, professors, uh, leaders in your fields. For those of you that have joined us on Facebook Live, thank you for making the time. You're here because you want to hear something that addresses your concern, something that you think you may have a question for and has not been answered as yet or as well by wherever you're getting your care for, or you're somebody who's wanting to know a little bit more about those that are either in your family or are known to you or generally interested in what happens in kidney disease for a large number of people. The numbers are staggering. And the numbers of people, while our screen is full of experts, they're not nearly enough to take care of the entire burden of disease that India has. And that is a challenge in and of itself. Let me start with Professor Bala. So what happens, and at a broad terms, what happens when the kidneys decide that they're not going to function as well? When they function, nobody knows that there's a pair of kidneys in our body. But when it doesn't function as well as it should, what happens? What is it that people present themselves with? What is it that they should be aware of that their kidney is not doing as well? This is to kind of set the conversation at the broadest level for our audience before we get into the specifics. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. Uh, broadly, actually, uh, everyone should have the minimum knowledge is that there are two types of kidney failure. One is acute renal failure and one is chronic renal failure. And in th these are broad two terms. So there can always be overlap. There can be acute on chronic renal failure when the acute uh, illness can superimpose on a chronic kidney disease or chronic renal failure. So acute is when there is an abrupt or sudden uh, stoppage of kidney functions, which can happen in short, suddenly for intradiac um, myocardial infarction, hypotension, septicemia, septic shock, or some uh, poisonous, uh, some toxic substances or some drugs causing acute renal failure. Or sometimes some, there is a blockage of the blood supply, so renal artery blockage, some renal vein blockage, or sometimes a uh, out, outflow obstruction, and some stone is there which causes obstruction. So these, there is a sudden stoppage of kidney functions. This can be reversible also or irreversible also. So a proper diagnosis has to be made, and depending on that, we have to manage the patients. Most of these diseases can recover actually. So in a way, acute kidney injury is reversible. Acute renal failure broadly is reversible, except for few conditions. Now coming to chronic renal failure. So chronic is when there is a slow, insidious course of the disease, and gradually and gradually the kidney functions uh, is deteriorating, and over a period of time, which may take few years actually, or even a decade, the, before the patient goes into end-stage renal disease or requires dialysis. So here we have to understand that there are two most important causes of chronic kidney disease or chronic renal failure. That is number one is diabetes, which is now throughout the world actually it has become number one cause, followed by hypertension, followed by the kidney disease itself, like nephritis or glomerular diseases. Then we had we have polycystic kidney disease, hereditary diseases, and in our country, renal calculus disease or stone formation, then urinary tract infections, then various drugs in, and toxins causing uh, and like painkillers causing damage to the kidneys, infections in the urinary tract. And there is an, another identity, uh, disease entity, which we have recently identified is a chronic kidney disease of unknown origin, like especially in Andhra, where maybe that some local contaminants are there or pesticides are there, some local toxins are there, which is causing this kidney. So this right. disease, chronic kidney disease, patient is usually asymptomatic till he has almost 70 to 80% damage of the kidneys. Unlike in acute renal failure where it is abrupt and even when it is just 24 hour duration, patient may be symptomatic. In chronic, patient will become symptom symptomatic once his disease has gone to as, as bad as 90% damage. So only at that stage, the patient gets symptoms. So for a, a, every general population, it is very important to understand that when the kidney disease patient becomes sym symptomatic, he has already suffered almost 70 to 80% of the kidney damage. Thank you, sir. I mean, it was, it was just as well that I started with the professor so that we got the full range 
and the, and the broad classification of where kidney disease was. You can have like a door abruptly shut and nobody can cross, that's acute. And a door that's gradually, slowly narrowing down and shutting over a period of time, you can still cross over till finally one day it was so narrow that you couldn't cross. And that's, that's the chronicity of it. That's the word picture that I can give you. Immediate shutdown, you didn't have too much of a warning versus something that was gradually happening. And broadly, things to be worried about, if you've got diabetes, if you've got hypertension, if you've got periodic infections of the lower of the urinary tract, whether it is because of stones or because of uh, whatever else, uh, or could be secondary to diabetes, or if you're taking some kind of drugs on long standing, um, all of those could give rise to kidney disease or faltering of your kidney function. There could be some things that are basically inherent to the kidney itself, and those could be very, very specific, like um, the uh, polycystic or other kinds of diseases that uh, the professor mentioned. May I then turn to Dr. Sampath Kumar? For all these presentations, whether it's acute or chronic, what do people feel or how, what do they, they don't know that they've got kidney disease, but they have something else that they come to and complain, or they feel that at home. What is it that people should be watching out for? So generally, people are very aware of the urine volume that uh, they pass. So that is one of the important factors. They, the minute that they know that their urine volume is not as good, then they rush to the doctor. Uh, possibly in 24 hours, then they will come to the doctor. Second is when they develop some degree of uh, swelling in the legs, especially when they are traveling uh, in the bus or the train, after 24 hours, say, or six hours or eight hours, if they feel that the uh, feet have swollen up, then that is another reason for them to seek medical advice. The third is very easy to, uh, it's a no-brainer, that when there is a, a blood in the urine, immediately they rush to the doctor that uh, there is a red urine. They come immediately to the doctor. So these are very immediate um, <clears throat> symptoms which will bring the patient to the doctor. There are other things like loss of appetite, feeling listless, all these are very advanced stages of kidney disease, which will uh, make the patient seek medical help. Right, sir. So you broadly classified into if, suppose you normally passed a certain volume of urine during the yeah. day, you went five times or six times or yeah. whatever it was, and you had a certain amount, that coming down is a warning sign. Yeah. If your feet are swelling up, and yes. it's not something that is going away by having slept well and having yep. raised your uh, feet up. You need to be wondering what's going on here. If you're seeing the color of your urine get too yep. red, then you definitely have to be worried about something that's that's completely abnormal. Yep. But I want to just ask one question. Yeah. Norm, normal urine color is mostly pale white. Has color something to tell us if it's getting to be a little bit more darker? Not red, more yellow, yeah. deeper, See, darker? Yeah, yeah, deeper uh, color, like amber color. Uh, possibly if the, uh, the water intake is not too good, right, if it is inadequate, then the urine becomes slightly darker. And you should see to it that your color of the urine stays as close to uh, the water as possible. Then that's a good sign that your hydration is good, especially in the summer months. Uh, it is better that you keep yourself well hydrated. Right. So we lose water in two ways broadly. We use, lose it through our kidneys, which is the normal amount of urine that we kind of lose. And we also use, lose it through our skin. So for those of us that are watching it on Facebook Live, in summer months, you when you sweat, you are losing a fair bit of water that may give rise to a little less volume in the urine. And that could also give rise to a little bit of the color change. If an adequate amount of water corrects that, I yeah. suppose not to worry, but that I will kind of take, take it to Dr. Shashir Gang next. Um, but by and large, if these problems persist, Dr. Shashir Gang, either urine volume comes down, feet swelling, which is not going to be getting taken care of, there's blood in the urine or persistent discoloration. What is it that the person needs to do? See, once Even you, before we come to the complications of COVID. Uh, once you realize that either urine volume is low or it got swelling of the feet, it indicates that something is wrong in the body. 
and you need to take immediate medical attention. So unfortunately, some of these things cannot be done at home. You need to really go to the doctor. So if you find swelling of the feet, if you find decrease in the urine output, or if you find blood in the urine, you have to seek medical help and go to the hospital and see a doctor. Usually, once you see a doctor, he will run you through a battery of tests. First, he'll take a detailed story, how it happened, how it began, what are the associated symptoms, whether you have hypertension, diabetes, or pain or no pain, other things they will evaluate. Take a detailed family history also, and then run you through a battery of tests. These tests usually include a urine examination, some blood tests to test you about your kidney function, and also some degree of imaging will be done, like ultrasound or x-rays will be done. And based on that, then they will come to a diagnosis and then decide whether further tests like biopsy or something is required or not. So like that, a comprehensive evaluation is mandatory if you find any symptoms which are not of the routine. So if, if you're presenting with any one of the symptoms, or if, if there's a reduction in your urine volume, if your feet are swelling up, if the color is changing, you can't manage this at home. Please don't attempt it. Um, and that's, that's something that kind of is, should be both a uh, public service announcement and also a warning. You need to seek attention from somebody who knows what, how to kind of both diagnose and get you onto an appropriate line of care. Do not attempt stuff at home. Do not rely on something that you read on WhatsApp. Do not rely on what you're gathering on Google. These are all great information tools, but they do not replace the wisdom and the experience that your physician has. Please go to them. They will sort out your list of complaints and get you onto the appropriate management line based on the tests that they need to do. If they say an ultrasound is required, if they say that your urine needs to be examined, a bunch of blood tests need to be done, they may also ask you to go and see a cardiologist. Please do so. These are necessary so that an appropriate diagnosis can be ascertained. Because if you don't have a good diagnosis, the next steps are going to be very, very confused and is not going to be good for you. And so therefore, don't take matters into your hands. Get to the nearest healthcare facility possible. And if possible, make sure that you are following the advice that's being given to you. Dr. Narayan Prasad, all the tests are done. And now an, a decision point has arrived at. It all happened over 24 hours, which means there's one way to go. It happened over the last two years. It's another set of conversations that take place. In that kind of a position, how do you decide what is the next step? Or what is it? what are the options open to you immediately? Something happened yesterday, and today I'm here in front of you. Something happened over two years, and I'm coming and complaining. Is, it, is there an issue with me? As you understood, uh, with, uh, Professor Bhallad, he spoke well that uh, we might have the two kind of uh, condition that is the two the kidney injury and uh, chronic kidney disease. So it is possible that this, this patient, when they are coming immediately within 24 hours of this problem, this might be the acute kidney injury, which might have happened because of some infection developing sepsis. That may happen because the patient, some patients have taken some NACID tablets in dehydrated state. That may happen after uh, the patient has uh, dehydration uh, because of a uh, lot of problems happening because of the gastroenteritis, severe gastroenteritis and uh, leading to dehydration, hypotension and or other, uh, any kind of the volume loss. Thank you, thank you Dr. Anand uh, Key point there is if it's something that's happening over a very short period of time, 24 to 48 hours, and there are kind of, let's just say very vivid uh, presentations, in all likelihood, the doctor will want you to stay in the hospital. If it is something that's been happening over a period of time, it's a judgment call and it could be more tests and then you come back in or it could be as Dr. Prasad was just now saying, a quick assessment as to is there something else going on that will require more immediate interventions. But let me turn to Dr. Mehul Shah here because you're the one that is dealing with a very specific subset of people, children. Children may sometimes present very, very differently. They may have uh, a urinary, uh, they may say that 
I don't want to go to the toilet. Or even if they do, we may not understand it. Our mothers may not be able to pick it up. How do you identify that a child is actually getting into kidney uh, problems? That's a very special subset. And then, then I'll kind of turn back to the others. Yes, uh, I th can divide this uh, answer into two parts. Uh, uh, one part is the younger children who are less than four to five years of age. And second group is the older children. So let me come to the older children first, because the symptoms uh, as described by Dr. Balla uh, and, and the rest of our members, uh, they may present with body swelling, they may present with blood in the urine, decreased urination, headaches, recurrent vomiting. So these are the symptoms which would make us think about a kidney problem in an older child. Now, 30 to 40 percent of children will have kidney problems because of uh, developmental problems or because of genetic problems. And they would present a little early. In these children, it is a challenge to pick up the kidney disease because the symptoms are going to be non-specific, not related to the kidney. And I think if I would like to emphasize, in a young child who is not growing well, the height and the weight as per the growth percentiles, which as pediatricians, we always plot them. If we feel that the growth of the child is altering, that's one important clue for kidney disease in a young, small child. In contrast to older children who would be passing less urine, some of the younger children with developmental problems in the kidney will actually pass more urine. Their frequency of urination is going to be more than the siblings. And that's a very easy comparison, whether the child is passing more number of uh, uh, times the urine and the more volume as compared to the sibling. Because of that, these children are thirsty and they end up drinking a lot of water. And even in the middle of the night, they get up to drink water, which is a little unusual after one year of age. Third thing could be they may be having repeated unexplained high fevers. As we know, most of the fevers are because of viral infections, but a small percentage could be because of urine infections. And the only symptom could be unexplained fever. We look at the urine examination and then confirm it's a urine inf infection and then take it further. And lastly, I would mention that young children may present with... Uh, delay in their physical milestones. What they are supposed to do at one year of age, they are not able to do. They may start walking at two years of age, start talking at three to four years of age. They may have some leg deformities. So these are some of the other features with which the, present, uh, the parents will come and we need to think about a kidney problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayulsha. Because the reason why I wanted to kind of insert um, that bit right in the middle of the conversation was, um, let, let me ask a clarifying question before I kind of uh, yes. proceed with my comments. Of a hundred children, how many do you think present with or have kidney diseases? Oh, well, we do not have the uh, uh, epidemiological numbers, but from the Western countries, what we know is that uh, roughly uh, the chronic kidney disease, that is something which uh, uh, our uh, members have mentioned, whether it's kidney failure, that is seen in uh, roughly one in uh, uh, 5,000 to 10,000 children. But we do not have the uh, uh, percentage of children having the other types of kidney problems. And I think that's something I'm not able to answer. And, and so that, that's something that we need to kind of be looking out a lot more. So parents, if you're watching and if you're kind of thinking about your parents, your older parents as the ones that have got kidney disease and you're kind of tuning into this program for understanding about that, be mindful that kidney disease is not just among the older people. They're also possible among young children. And in fact, if children are failing to thrive, if there are difficulties, uh, particularly if they are urinating more or if there is um, other features that they are showing up, then you need to get to somebody. Your pediatrician is probably your first best stop to be able to get an investigation pathway set up so that we are considering the possibility of a kidney disease, eliminating it, and then kind of getting into the other parts of it. But do not, for any moment in time, discount the fact that there could be a possible kidney problem also with a child, because that's important. And if you miss it, it's just a whole lifetime that is ahead that we're kind of missing out on. And so therefore, an early intervention is useful. Now that we've established that kidney disease could happen pretty much acute, it's an injury, something happened or it happened over a period of time you had your diabetes which you were not taking care of you did not exercise well enough or that there was uncontrolled hypertension so again 
for the Facebook audience, if there is diabetes, if you're go- passing urine more frequently, if you're drinking more water than normal, if your weight loss is unexplained, please make sure that somebody has seen you for a potential diabetes situation. Or if you have got an inability to walk for too long, SARS pull rye, or if you've got swelling in your feet, make sure that somebody has seen you to eliminate or address uh, hypertension. Both of these can actually put a load on your kidney in different ways. And that over a period of time, as Professor Bhalla said, you will not even know that you have lost your kidney function till it's too late. Better that it is picked up early. Dr. Narayan Prasad mentioned very helpfully two or three things that are very easily picked up. A urine examination is very useful. Are uh, there some things called proteins in your urine? It's a very simple examination, and that could very help be very helpful for your doctor to pick, basically make a referral to a nephrologist and say, please go and see somebody. And that would be a good first step to go. But irrespective of either of these, and now we kind of particularly focus on the chronic diseases, because the acute ones, you will definitely go into the hospital and something will need to be done immediately. What happens in chronic diseases? There's a failing kidney. It is going to be something that is that you're going to live with for a long period of time. And you literally come to a conversation with your nephrologist. And that's where we have two sets of people who can manage it in two different ways. One is to say, you know what? Let's go and think about a transplant. And there might be another set of another set of options there. Really, a transplant may not work for you. And those are very complicated decisions. Let's get you onto a dialysis program, or let's get you onto a dialysis till you're ready for a transplant. All of these are ways, and that those are important, difficult gateway conversations because that then determines how you're going to live how your family is going to take care of you, how your finances and your circumstances are going to change, all of that become very, very complicated at that moment in time. And this is where I want to turn to another set of people. I mean, and I'll come back to you, Professor Zballa, uh, Dr. Sampath, Dr. Shishigan, um, Dr. Narayan Prasad, and Dr. Meolcha. But I want to kind of look at the other sets of people that we have right now on the line. At what point? Do you say to uh, somebody, you know what, let's hold off on a transplant. You may not be ready for it. Dr. Raka. So when we say chronic kidney disease, it has various stages. You know, So we classify it from stage one to stage five, depending on the glomerular filtration rate, which is calculated by a nephrologist. So we do conservative management with various diet uh, therapies, uh, dietary prescriptions, which we give and certain medications. In some set of patients, we may give special medicines like ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers in diabetics. So all kinds of therapies, we try to retard the progression of the renal disease. And uh, we try to, to do this till the patient either becomes symptomatic for his renal failure or the GFR is, say, less than 10 ml per minute, wherein we suggest the patient to go on a renal replacement therapy, which could be any form of dialysis or a transplant. So the indication for going on to renal replacement therapy could be one, a patient voice problem. Could you, yeah, yeah, it was your line. Could you just mute your line, ma'am? One second. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Thank you so Is much. Is it clear? Yes. Yeah. Are the others, if you could mute your lines, please. So, Thank uh, you so much. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, basically, the indication for renal replacement therapy could be at a GFR of 15 also if the patient is very symptomatic. So, either the patient becomes symptomatic or the GFR, which is calculated by the nephrologist, is say less than 10 ml per minute, then the patient is offered a renal replacement therapy. And that is where the decision comes, which has to be made in connivance with the patient. The patient and the nephrologist have to sit together and decide. So uh, definitely, if the patient fits all criteria, and if the patient is has a donor, an appropriate donor, and is physically fit to undergo a transplant, then definitely transplant should be the first thing which should be offered to the patient. Sure. So we would prefer a preemptive transplant, which is a transplant. We, the patient goes on to a transplant without a dialysis. 
in any case if the patient is not mentally physically prepared for a transplant there are financial constraints or there is no donor then the patient is offered dialysis which again is either peritoneal or hemodialysis right uh, dr santosh the important thing which i would like to emphasize yeah no no yeah. i'll come back to you i'll come back to you ma'am yeah. i'll come back to you yeah. are there are there people i mean dr rakesh kind of said the re, the conditions under which a transplant should be offered and i sus i suspect um dialysis is only a holding pattern till a renal replacement is available um whether from a live donor or a cadaveric donor or whichever way it is are there cases where you would say no a transplant is not possible or you are not a candidate for transplant and, and and therefore you need to continue on on dialysis and then we'll come back to the transplant conversations and the dialysis in between am i audible yes please okay so as uh, ma'am said uh, live transplant is the best and preemptive transplant is probably what we should aim for if we see a slowly failing kidney however uh, there are some situations in which transplant may be not easily possible or advisable but potentially if there is a medical problem that is likely to worsen after transplantation some of them are ongoing malignancies and there are cut off years we need to wait after the malignancy has been treated and there is no recurrence seen that we do a transplant heart disease that can worsen after transplantation lung disease that can worsen after transplantation liver disease that can worsen after transplantation or any other medical condition that gets worse after transplantation is potentially something which we wouldn't rush into transplant for earlier we used to say things like uh, having hiv infection or avu incompatibility were contraindications but now they are no longer so we can uh, and should uh, try transplantation for these patients as well so in in a nutshell if there's an ongoing a uh, serious medical condition that can progress after transplantation we should hold on and not rush into doing a transplantation for these patients so for the facebook audience there are many things that earlier we did not get into a transplant conversation today those are not contraindications the only contraindication the only place where your nephrologist or your urologist and the transplant team would say no we will not go forward is where your condition might get further worsened the chances that you will have a transplant but your overall health is going to further deteriorate those are not great places to go in for a transplant and and as mentioned uh, certain ki kinds of cancers a uh, heart disease that's not been resolving very well lung disease or liver disease those are all places where there would be the consideration that you might not be better off after a transplant but in almost all other cases as dr rakas said a transplant is potentially the best thing that can be done for the individual and we have come to a place where the techniques are good enough the outcomes are brilliant and for those that can have it in time the number of healthy years is actually quite remarkable and the range of activities is pretty similar to what you could have with let's put it this way what people are more uh, familiar with a, a, a cardiac bypass and and you could kind of actually get to that level of activity and normalcy too and so therefore anything that prevents you from getting a transplant have that conversation if you're eligible do indicate your interest and this is a broader question then because india has got a substantially large number of people living with kidney disease we can hold a lot of people on dialysis in a holding pattern but that is not a best utilization of both professional or individual time and resources we need a better and a more streamlined ability to offer the best quality of service to all that need it and so therefore there's a broader question that needs to be asked and answered and i'm just tabling it so that we know that this is something that will come out only when enough people are asking why can't i have my transplant in time or why should i kind of wait on a dialysis situation when really there could be other solutions and so therefore let me then turn to dr taranjaloka in these times and this is where i mentioned covid for the first time right 
um, given that these are the circumstances, we have people, a large number of people today looking at dialysis or on a transplant wait list, and then COVID happens. Does life change for people substantially because there's COVID or can life go on for people with chronic kidney disease awaiting transplant or scheduled for transplant and now waiting for the COVID to go away? Good afternoon, everyone, all listeners from Facebook as well and all panel members. So the question is, has COVID-19 infection or pandemic, has, has it affected the management of kidney diseases, whether it is dialysis or transplant? So I would say yes in certain terms. For example, if you see the recommendations, normal transplant, the elective surgeries, including transplant, has been postponed. Why? Because if you consider transplant in a patient, these patients will be more immunosuppressed and they may have higher risk of infection. So unless there is an emergency, an emergency can only happen in one situation, which is a adequate, suitable disease donor or cadaver donor is available and a patient has got a very good match. In that scenario, probably you will take a chance explaining to the patient and family that though there is a risk, but this is the best chance he or she has, one can proceed for transplant. That is about transplant. And about dialysis, see, dialysis doesn't stop because if you stop dialysis, then obviously the patient may become sick and they may crash land to emergency for admission, which nobody at this moment of time wants. So as has been briefly discussed, that there are two types of dialysis. One is uh, peritoneal dialysis, which is predominantly home-based. So there is no problem at all. They can continue with peritoneal dialysis at home without any added or increased risk of exposure from outside. But the question is those who are on maintenance hemodialysis, especially in a hospital setup. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, they have to travel at least two or three times in a week to the hospital. And they are very worried. They are anxious. They are worried that they may acquire infection going to the hospital or traveling outside. Because lockdown means lockdown. You have to stay home. And we are forcing them to come out of the uh, house and go to the hospital very frequently. So in such scenarios, though, as I said, dialysis cannot be stopped, due precautions has to be taken. And there are several guidelines, several countries, including Indian guidelines, are also there, which say that apart from personal hygiene, um, coughing and sneezing etiquettes and hand washing. Regarding travel, there is a guideline that it's preferred not to take a public transport. You should travel on your own vehicle and if possible, take a cab where there are no crowding and that decreases the risk of exposure of the dialysis patient. Let me here also tell you all these kidney patients, whether it is a renal failure patient, non-renal failure patient or a transplant patient, by virtue of having a kidney disease are at higher risk of acquiring infection. So that I'll come back to that. Yeah. Yes. Fine. I'll, I'll come back to that. So in, in reality, life can go on with all yes. the precautions, whether there's COVID outside or not, because a transplant unit or a dialysis facility is essentially following all precautions and they are supposed to be safe, provided you turn up safe in that facility. The difficulty might be from your home to the facility, whether you have to turn up once or twice a week, and that is a risk. But by and large centers, which are well run, will definitely be a very safe place for you to continue on with your uh, dialysis program or for whatever else that the intervention needs to be. There are questions from the Facebook Live audience too. So I'm not on a transplant program as yet. I'm not kind of looking at it. I am going for my dialysis thrice a week. Can I come down to twice a week, Dr. Pankaj Hans? I'm audible. Yes, sir. I'm yes, audible. Sir. Actually, yeah. in this lockdown period, what we have been noticed that several centers have already curtailed the frequency of dialysis of patients from thrice a week to twice a week, from four hours to three hours. But the problem is that patient is habituated to thrice a week dialysis. If he is subjected to twice a week dialysis, definitely he will need more rigorous fluid and salt intake. Plus the potassium intake needs to be regulated. The patients on thrice weekly dialysis take a lot of protein. If the same amount of protein the patient will go on taking, he might become uremic. So if it is at all feasible, then don't curtail the duration of dialysis. Don't curtail the frequency of dialysis. 
let it be continued to thrice weekly schedule so who is making this decision of uh, reducing it is it something that is coming in from the nephrologists from the clinicians from the hospital or is it something also based on what the patient is um uh, patients of uh, not comfort but but uh, probabilities of reaching the hospital uh, during these lockdown times what what is controlling the reduction time well, it is coming two ways patients are also demanding we are facing problem in coming to the hospital and going back that is one issue secondly so, the patients if they come thrice to the hospital they will there is a likelihood of infecting the dialysis technicians and the nephrologist also so the nephrologists and technicians also they want the dialysis frequency to get reduced sometimes this is a reality so both ways so, the frequency is reduced but not at all centers and right. so our center have not curtailed the duration and frequency of dialysis also. so your center has not curtailed the okay. duration we are frequency. going with the four hour session and thrice a week right yeah but but there are enough people that are asking that question can i kind of uh, is a reduced frequency good dr lalith may i kind of then turn to you whether it's a center or whether it's the individual difficulty people are coming down from 3 to 2 are there dietary modifications i know that dr pankaj just briefly mentioned them but are there dietary modifications that people need to be aware of especially when they are curtailing their frequency of dialysis so uh, basically during this uh, testing time we have a lot of problems problems in terms of staff problems in terms of social distancing and reducing the number of uh, dialysis stations because we have to give proper gap of at least 6 foot between two beds and then patients uh, are facing problem in coming to dialysis center okay. so what we have done in our unit though we are advising to come three times in a week but because of logistics and staff problem patients are not able to come three times in a week so in some patients who are really troubled we are considering two times in a week in this scenario we are asking them to reduce or cut down on their dietary intake basically there are two types of emergencies which happen in our dialysis patient one is volume overload and the other is hyperkalemia so to reduce the volume overload we are asking the patients to take less salt and water and adding some diuretics if they have some residual renal functions diuretics will help in improving the urine output and we are also strictly modify uh, asking the patients to strictly follow low potassium diet so that suddenly the potassium do not go high and they can they come to our unit crashing with lot of emergency uh, problem so we are asking them to strictly adhere to low potassium diet and use in in some susceptible patients we are also giving some potassium binding regimens so that their potassium do not go very high by these modifications we are able to manage uh, many of our patients but still in uh, uh, my experience last 3 weeks i have come up across a uh, few emergencies where the patients have landed with lvf and hyperkalemia where we had to arrange for emergency dialysis sure thank you so much sir so yes you may potentially for whatever reason come down from a thrice weekly schedule to a twice weekly schedule but they need to be managed with an appropriate reduction or modification of how much fluid you're taking how much of potassium is in your diet those would be advice that would come from your dietitian or your nephrology team they will be the ones that will give you a, a modified diet chart and also ask you to take your weight properly so that you do not come into a situation as dr agarwal said an emergency situation where you have to land to the hospital on an unscheduled requirement of a dialysis uh, session and that would be difficult but here's where i turn to dr bhat the months ahead we are already in april 
India is going to warm up. And as it gets warmer, people are going to feel thirsty too. How do we manage as we go forward, both a lockdown situation and an environment that is not exactly going in the direction or helpful for people with kidney disease? Um, what's your advice and how do we kind of even manage that? Um, thank you very much, Bobby, for that question. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what I would say is this is where we have to individualize. This is where we have to be flexible. So if I if I say, uh, you know, so we have to, you know, have that conversation with every patient rather than just pass on the message through a nurse saying that everybody start coming twice a week or, you know, I don't want uh, anybody to come twice a week. I want everybody to stick to three times a week. So we have to speak to every patient. There could be people who have no problems coming and they would rather come because of their past history of having repeated volume overload issues. There could be people who, uh, for whatever reason, would actually like to come uh, twice a week, or there are people who are quite stable and you would want to suggest to them that you, you, you should probably come twice a week. This is going to lessen their exposure and also lessen the burden on the staff. Now, now whatever we decide, it's not written in stone. So if something happens, you have to give them the leeway that they have to contact you at the earliest. If they're struggling, they have to contact you at the earliest, whatever it might be, and then you can pump it up back to three times a week or make it four, four hours every session, etc. So you, know, you will be surprised. People who have not been compliant with their fluid until now, with the COVID coming, they're more compliant. They, they would rather do the two times a week dialysis and be extra uh, cautious about the fluid and the potassium they take than what they were doing before when it was coming from elsewhere rather than them understanding it themselves. So I, I can see that those who have opted it by themselves, they are actually doing quite well. However, it is early days. These things only build up. So the, the amount of toxins building up, its effect on the heart and elsewhere, it is probably going to show up after a period of time. So I don't want to keep these people who've been on long-term dialysis, say two years, three years, five years, three times a week. I don't want to keep them on twice a week dialysis or reduce you know, hours of dialysis for very long. We have, we have done it for a select few. We have not done any blanket therapy. And we have told them that this is flexible. If you're having problems, please don't hesitate to get back to us. We will have a discussion again. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt. Um, Dr. Saha, I mean, it's, it's interesting, I mean, uh, what Dr. Bhatt is saying, that because of the current circumstances and with individuals doing their own risk assessments, not just the uh, nephrologists and the, the treating physicians assessing it, but individuals also assessing their own risk, they are tending towards a little bit more of conservative behavior in terms of uh, addressing their own fluid intake or in terms of what they're eating. But he also mentioned, that it requires individualization, which means a lot of talking, not just by the nurses, but by the nephrologists or the treating physicians. How are you managing this? And this is where the question comes along. Somebody has also asked us, is there a role for telemedicine or is there a role that we can kind of be talked to over a distance? Uh, is Dr. Saha dropped off? Yes, sir. I mean, how, how would you kind of continue this conversation um, with people, individualize it. How much of it is it taking your time right now? If I may ask Dr. Bala, um, the same question. We are doing regularly uh, telemedicine at our hospital. We are what we we patient. Uh, it is through the hospital. Patient takes the appointment uh, on uh, Dandaram Hospital website, and then we have a tele consultation. It is a paid consultation. Then some patients, what they do is they pay on Paytm. And then uh, they give us a message. Then they, we give them a consultation on WhatsApp. Then third is certain apps are available. We have uh, some, a group of doctors also have brought our own uh, uh, app, my follow-up app. So all three modalities we are using. And patients actually are very much comfortable with that. And most of the time what they do is they upload all the, all the investigations, blood tests, and uh, ultrasound reports, x-ray, everything. And then we can have a video consultation. So it is a video consultation most of the time. And then we, pre we prescribe the medicines also because now it has been allowed by MCI. So there is no problem, no legal issues with that. And we are finding it quite, patients are very happy. We are also happy. 
so every day at least i am doing uh, uh, almost 8 to 10 uh, telemedicine consultations daily right uh, so i mean that, that that kind of reduces both your uh, optimizes your time and also kind of prevents people from putting themselves at risk by uh, moving along dr mohanty um is this the way that we are going to go forward except for when decisions are to be made the first few times that people are coming in um is this the this is the modality that we're going to go forward with that most of the continuing care gets shifted off into such virtual consultations except when interventions need to happen and 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 a transplant surgery needs to be taking place and post that also you could continue on to the virtual world is this what you're kind of seeing as a a, a post covid scenario uh, good afternoon everybody i'm audible yes, yes sir yeah uh, definitely uh, this is uh, this uh, this covid has actually taught us to how to as dr bhala told that he is uh, already doing the telemedicine medicine things and actually while on the way uh, we are organizing these things and because our most of the patient because there are a number of nephrologists in india is very less so majority of the patient they uh, they come from far off places uh, around 500 even dr bhala get from 2000 km away the patient is there so i think uh, suppose somebody is coming to you as a chronic kidney disease on regular follow up and is stable so for for his uh, next one or two or three uh, consultation can be done on uh, this telemedicine so that that will reduce his uh, traveling and this thing and all the troubles and definitely this is going to change uh, uh, for our suppose uh, again like a transplant patient who is stable he need not to come to the hospital and get the exposure to uh, not only covid or the other infection also so definitely this uh, telemedicine is going to revolutionize the chronic care at least the chronic care in this uh, country right thank you so much uh, but th- th- and because it's kidney disease writ large uh, there is a question and i want to kind of just uh, focus it on to those that are interventional here uh, in terms of i have got a uh, renal stone diagnosed in my left ureter this is technically in the world of urology but uh, somebody kind of because asked is it possible to remove this um at this time during lockdown situations um who should i ask this question whoever if you just raise your hand i'll if, kind of uh, if, if there is an emergency if if yes, this stone is obstructing the ureter then it is an emergency then this surgery can be done you can put a stent or pc and whatever the urologist uh, but if there is no pain the stone is lying in the kidney and not in the ureter then one can wait right sir so if it is not causing you an acute urinary obstruction if it's not uh, causing you to be in gross pain then you can let it wait for a bit but do that with the consultation of your uh, care provider and this can be def- deferred for another time but if it is causing you difficulty this might actually injure your kidney further along make sure that you're getting the appropriate care and you should be able to get to your hospital because you'll be visibly in distress and so therefore that should not be something that uh, prevents you there's another set of questions that are coming in and i want to kind of turn around to um each of you people who are basically giving us their levels of hemoglobin and creatinine creatinine is usually high hemoglobin is low how should people kind of be uh, responding to that i don't want to get the specific numbers and the names but generally i mean the questions that are there uh, on my screen creatinine is on the higher side above 2 what should we be doing we are on dialysis numbers have come down to twice a week what should we be doing may I ask dr sapat kumar to start off with this round <clears throat> see the anemia is one of the major factors which uh, impacts on the quality of life so people who have very low hemoglobin they don't feel well their their energy levels are low and their appetite comes down so anemia has to be uh, properly managed especially when you are cutting down on dialysis so there are uh, certain aspects to the anemia in uh, patients on dialysis one is whether they are deficient in iron if iron uh, is deficient in their blood then you need to replenish iron with the, with the help of either tablets or with injections and also add on a, a, fa- a drug called erythropoietin which is normally it should be uh, ideally secreted from the kidney but because of the kidney failure 
the levels are low. So these patients require a combination of iron and erythropoietin. Uh, even if uh, the frequency of dialysis has come down, these two drugs have to be uh, properly uh, managed and they have to be administered these drugs because but anemia uh, is very, very important factor which will uh, reduce their quality of life. So anemia has to be corrected. Hemoglobin level should be in double digits. It should be around 10. So uh, Dr. Sa, uh, there were audio troubles last time. I was kind of getting to you. Hemoglobin should be in double digits. But to do that, you have iron supplementation, and you also have what uh, Dr. Sampath just now mentioned as a double poetin injections. But that requires, does that require coming to the hospital, or can that be something on, on a scheduled basis, be something that can be done at home? And is there, what is the role of exercise for such um, anemia patients? Can't hear you, sir. Can't hear you. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, to keep the at home, it's quite possible because this is subcutaneous in the injection. But if you have to give iron intravenously, it is preferable that first, at least first injection you should take at the hospital and subsequent also to a nearby nursing home because it is a matter of 30 minutes to have the safe side. So, uh, we will not period if one cannot come for IV iron. There is no iron available which can temporarily be of health. I am not saying that it's perfect considering the lockdown situation. Now, apart from the usual protein and iron, one must take folic acid also and in some patients maybe some vitamin supplementation like B and C may be needed. Now, coming to the exercise point, unless the human is above nine, I would recommend much of exercise because if the hemoglobin is low, the exercise tolerance will be poor. So if some patient has a hemoglobin which is 10 or above, physically fit, they should definitely have some form of exercise because they increase the longevity of the patient. Right. Thank you so much. So if you mute your line. Our apologies on that line. So I'm just going to kind of repeat what uh, Dr. Saha said uh, to the best of what I've heard is that, yes, you can continue with the injections that were already on. If you're starting off, then that is uh, a decision that has been taken by your uh, kidney care team, your nephrologist, and that the first one should be definitely under their supervision. But if it is something that you've been already on a schedule, then it can be done, delivered to you at your home or a nearby nursing home. That should not be an issue. On the matter of exercise, um, if you're on a lower side, if you're anemic in single digits, then that could actually aggravate some of the situation, if I, correct, if I heard you correctly. Um, and that should be under uh, monitoring or under good advice. Otherwise, if it's above, if you're reasonably okay, then exercise is something that's actually helpful for you. And those were the couple of questions that were there, and I'll come back to you on those. But let, let me come back again to this uh, cycle. Dr. Behul Shah, children, again, will not either, uh, it, it's going to be hard to kind of pick up um, whether they have a underlying kidney disease, it is at a point in time where we are kind of seeing COVID as and, and children as asymptomatic carriers. Is it something that is going to affect children with underlying kidney disease as badly or what's the prognosis for them? First of all, uh, coming to that answer, I, I think uh, certainly like adults, uh, children who have got kidney disease, uh, who have received kidney transplants, who are on various uh, medications, which we use to suppress the body's fighting system because of the nature of the disease. Yes, they are going to be at a higher risk of having complications of uh, COVID-19 disease. Not per se contracting the disease, but in case if they develop it, they are more likely to have complications and more severe course of the disease than otherwise healthy children who do not have chronic kidney disease. So answer is severity is going to be more but the frequency of contracting the disease is going to remain the same. 
if i can add over here fortunately children have been relatively spared as compared to adults and if we see the number of cases all over the world children have constituted maximum 3 to 5% of the total number of patients which have been affected by covid 19 and that's one positive thing except for children less than 3 4 years of age i think the disease is relatively milder in older children right and this is where i now turn turn to dr raka and dr santosh both of you i mean in transplant situations one which happened say in december to january period that's one set of people and for those that tra- had their transplants before that time and over 6 months ago and they're kind of all stabilized two different kinds of sets how do you think covid is affecting both sets dr raka first and then dr santosh if you can take the more recent ones and then i'll take the older ones with dr santosh yeah so you're talking of people who got transplanted in december in december yeah, january and then so three months COVID. three months yeah. down the line three months down yeah yeah so um, three the immunosuppression would be still in the tapering uh, phase and so obviously immunity levels like dr tarun said would be much lower than patients who had probably uh, transplant earlier and are on stable doses of immunosuppressants but the current recommendations say that uh, there is no need to change the doses of immunosuppressants in this scenario unless the patient develops a covid infection a fulminant covid infection then of course uh, certain drugs like um, mmf can be stopped and maybe tacrolimus can be tapered to maintain a level of around 4 nanograms per ml but apart from that if a patient is asymptomatic just because there is covid in the air there is no recommendation to taper their immunosuppressants the patient should just be told to stay at home and take the general precautions which everybody else is taking and and for those that have had a transplant 6 months or before um what would your kind of advice be dr santosh so uh as uh, ma'am just said the initial period is when this highest immunosuppression and that is the highest period of risk for any infection and possibly covid as well so older I mean or rather earlier transplant patients should continue their uh general medication general health measures and if they do become positive well they should then take a call on reducing immunosuppression at that point if they already if on a higher levels of mycophenolate but uh, otherwise they should continue like the other other patients and uh, follow general measures of uh, treatment right it's so not have, i kind of yeah, did not have any clear cut answers about using prophylaxis for uh, these patients as yet i'm not sure if you intended that to be a uh, part of this question no okay so then i won't deal with it now okay thank no you. because because that's where i'm going to now turn to dr tarun on this one um is this people who have had transplants and we kind of earlier on said that's the best way to move forward for people who've had uh, chronic kidney disease which need to be resolved we've had them people have been reasonably stable they are no longer on active immunosuppression they turn up with covid uh, infections as many people will is that particularly a nightmare scenario or is that something that will be handled the same way as everybody else because let's face it they've got a pair of well functioning kidneys now yeah so uh, let me tell you that uh, baseline immunosuppression will be present in all transplant patient irrespective of duration of transplant whether it is one year 10 year or whatever so that so, means there is always going to be a heightened risk if you have not necessarily it not necessarily that baseline immunosuppression actually puts them on equal risk as general population because it's so minimal right, right? so the question is if they acquire covid 19 infection what to do so we have to categorize them depending upon their symptoms and severity of infection if it is asymptomatic just because of exposure we have diagnosed it we are not going to change anything if it is mild to moderate symptoms again the same treatment what we offer for a general population would be offered but if there is a severe infection then probably there would be an individualization of decision by the treating team whether to cut down on some of these immunosuppressions or not will be again case to case based but then by and large their management would be same as in general population right so this is where i can turn to dr pankaj and to dr shishir gan i mean the probability of 
acquiring COVID infections among people with long-standing kidney disease and on dialysis. It's pretty much even. Nobody is more presupposed to it. There are some populations that might be, let's, let's put it say, less prone to getting it or less numbers are getting there, but it doesn't really kind of differentiate. But once they have it, people who have been on dialysis for long years or, or for a decent amount of time, is that going to be something that you will worry about? And are you thinking of worse prognosis here? Dr. Pankaj and the Dr. Shishir? Am I audible? Yes. Actually, the patients with chronic kidney disease per se, they are not more prone to COVID infection. But once COVID infection occurs, the morbidity and mortality is more in this subset of patients. But these patients, they are usually diabetics, hypertensive and diabetes and hypertension that increases the odds ratio of mortality in these patients. So that is why the mortality is more and one should worry if these patients develop COVID infection. But uh, is, uh, there is a series from UK, it was found that 15% uh, of patients who develop this uh, kidney involvement, they actually passed away. So definitely if the patient develops kidney infection, it is a matter of worry for all of us and meticulous management right from the diagnosis that should be instituted in all such patients. Dr. Shishir? I do agree with uh, Dr. Pankaj that uh, patients of kidney disease uh, are at a higher risk of getting complications. So in short, if they do get, and plus most of these patients of kidney disease have comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, many of them may be elderly also, and also uh, many are male. So these are more likely to get complications. So we need to really keep them under a watch much more. They may have more liberal indications to admission than compared to other patients. And uh, unfortunately, right now, we do not have any very effective therapies. So the management is essentially going to be similar to that, what you do for the normal patients. And as has been already mentioned, for even suppressed patients, a judicious consideration may be considered, depending upon individual cases, whether to reduce immunosuppression or not. I think more or less the management will remain more or less similar. And as far as real replacement therapy, like dialysis is concerned, more, maybe they may require more intensive dialysis because they become hypertensive. Right. But what, I just want to pick up on something that Dr. Pankaj mentioned, which is that people with diabetes, people with hypertension, the comorbidities, as you said, Dr. Shashay, yeah. I mean, are these more modifiable prior to that? Is, is it something that you can do in anticipation of, of, of let's put it say, better uh, diabetes control or better uh, hypertension control, does that kind of get you a better odds ratio as Dr. Pankaj said? Uh, no, I think, of course, even despite better control of diabetes and hypertension, the long-standing effect of these diseases are such that they will make them more prone or the body's defenses are poor. So even if you do acute control of them, it's not going to reduce their susceptibility or the outcomes too much. Of course, it is desirable that when, even otherwise, or uh, when they get the disease, to control them very well. But uh, these are, there's a lot of what we call as a metabolic memory. So this metabolic memory does not really go away, and you are still prone to it, despite having adequate control. So patients might tell us, the doctor, my diabetes was well controlled. I did everything to control it. My hypertension was well controlled. I followed all the rules of the game. But these diseases does affect your system such that you become more prone, and if you do get it, you get it much more severely. Dr. Pankaj, you had to say something yeah, before I go to yeah, Dr. Bhatt. Actually, I agree with Dr. Sichir, but actually if a patient with COVID admitted hospital and the HbA1c is more than 9, so there is more than 60% chances of getting severity of the disease in these patients. Right. So you're, you're kind of clearly indicating that... Uh, both is the standing subset. control is more important, but even if the patient's current diabetic status is poorly controlled, that will add to the morbidity in these patients. So is this something that Dr. Bhatt, I mean, at, at a particular point, because there's so many things happening around, is it a place where you would want to work a lot more on the diabetes control for your existing um, dialysis patients? Or is it something that you would say, um, we will kind of uh, go as it's going right now? See, you know, it, it is very important to uh, uh, look at diabetes and blood pressure control at all times, and more so now, as uh, Dr. Pankaj said, that there, there is evidence that poorly controlled diabetes is going to be uh, a, a negative predictor of uh, morbidity and mortality. So all the more reason that we have to concentrate on that. 
um, it, but it is going to be a challenge because uh, you know your ability to connect with them, uh, their ability to connect with the diabetic nurses, everything is you know much lower than what it was in good times. Uh, luckily, you know our diabetic nurses are available very freely on the app. We do have an app. They are, they are freely available on the app. They just you know, our patients just have to sign up. And then these uh, nurses, if it is something that uh, is out of their control, they flag it up to the doctors and we are able to handle it. So we, we just have to educate them that, you know, it is even more important now. You know, it's important to make sure that their cardiovascular risk comes down, that, that, that they control their diabetes and blood pressure. But now with the COVID, they have to control it even uh, you know, stringently so that they avoid the morbidity of the, uh, the infection. So you, you're again pointing back to the need for a lot of communication between the patient and the treating team, the nephrologists, the nurses, the dietitians, everybody who forms part of the team to be in more communication than ever before, simply because the risks are a lot more higher. How does uh, a facility like yours, Dr. Lalit, um, manage that increased expectation or the need for communication right now? How are you able to kind of even address that, given that you've got only 24 hours and your teams are also going to be stressed with the workload that comes along? Uh, during these times, actually, when uh, uh, the resources are limited and because of social distancing and universal precautions to prevent the spread of infection, we are not doing routine consultations for the patient. Most of the time, patients are calling us on our telephone. And if needed, sometimes we are doing video calling with them. If we need to visualize something, we are trying to adjust their prescriptions. But otherwise, most of the patients, they are maintaining their old prescriptions. And they are more, rather more or less, they are maintaining well. Most of our patients also understand that this is a difficult uh, scenario everyone is passing through. So they are also not taxing the healthcare provider unnecessarily. Having said that, still we are available to our patients. Whenever they want to call us, we are receiving their call. We are all there, including all members of my team, to answer and adjust their prescriptions if the need be. Right. And so this is where Dr. Bhalla, I mean, uh, he was uh, taking the example of uh, in Sagangaram Hospital. And I believe, uh, Dr. Bhatt, you also mentioned this. And I, I, I can't remember who else mentioned this, that you have got apps now. And so therefore, um, it, it's, it's a lot of switchover that's taking place. So there is the possibility or feasibility of increased interaction with your patients uh, because technology allows it. And that allows you to get more fine-tuned advice into uh, individuals um, uh, there. And so that, that kind of is really helpful. Uh, let, me, let me kind of um, ask this question to Dr. Uh, Mohanty here. Um, I am a, and this is coming from a patient uh, who's kind of raised this question. I have had a transplant done. I have stopped taking my pneumonia injection. Is it necessary to continue taking injections? And I'm not quite sure what, I mean, my range of understanding of that is a little bit restricted. Uh, you make better sense out of this question. Actually, uh, pre-transplant, we gave uh, this pneumonia, there are two pneumonia injection is there. We give pneumo uh, 13 and pneumo 23. Right. Okay. Actually, those who are already above 60, they are needed to uh, take this pneumo 13. And pneumo 23 has to repeat it every uh, five years. So if he has right. taken five years back, he can take it. If he is uh, okay, there is no active infection or like this. So right. Yeah. So so therefore, the advice is that if it's a five yearly thing and you're probably in the window, you don't need to rush into it. Um, yeah. But if you are, then, then uh, get get your uh, regular schedule. A little bit of uh, this year, that way should not really make much of a difference. Is that correct? Probably, right? probably, uh, probably uh, he's asking not this uh, pneumo. Probably he's asking about the influenza injection. 
<laughs> probably potential potential because i could not i could not make that thing yes. so if it is pneumonia do we have two pneumonia that is uh, pneumo 23 and uh, 30 sure and they usually the pneumo uh, 23 is repeated every 5 years and in influenza uh, as per uh, the schedule every year it has to be taken every year right thank you so much mm-hmm. and and there's another question that is there um is the life expectancy the same in abo tra- incompatible transplant um what is my expectation um is this a question that's coming up um dr raka is the life expectancy same yeah. in abo incompatible so the question is blocked basically abo incompatible transplant is where transplant is done across the blood group barriers and the blood groups are not matching sure. and uh, a lot of data has shown that uh, He, is he talking about the expectancy of the kidney or the life expectancy life life the word life is expected. life expectancy yes i think life expectancy should not be different between an abo and abo yeah some studies have shown a higher infection rate in abo incompatible transplants because the immunosuppression used is much higher uh, compared to an abo compatible transplant oh, but overall i think the life expectancy is almost the same as an abo compatible and dr ram prasad i mean there's a question here which says for how many years can a patient be on dialysis if he does not opt for transplant and i know that there is no age mentioned here dialysis provides a good quantity of life but quality of life is definitely superior on renal transplantation but as far as the concern of the survival on dialysis usually in india the just uh, about a year back when uh, publication came from hyderabad where the free dialysis has been provided to the public and uh, our almost 50% of patients who was either living or dying within a year time on dialysis on maintenance dialysis that was so free so that was one concern but you will have the centers and you will have the patients who are there on the dialysis for 15 or 20 years we have at present one patients on the dialysis for 18 years now so it is possible that if the patient on the good quality of dialysis thrice weekly dialysis uh, twice weekly for the low body persons is fine but you if your uh, your body surface area is good your bmi is fairly good you cannot maintain any patients on maintenance hemodialysis of twice per week this is good breeze for twice week till the patients go for the transplantation if the patients decides to be on maintenance dialysis for life long then it is always advisable to give the dialysis thrice weekly at least 12 hours of the dialysis per week that can prolong and gives you good quality of the life as well and you can many times you cannot differentiate patients on maintenance dialysis and uh, otherwise normal patients so right this depends on the quality of dialysis what kind of the quality frequency the patient is receiving so that is the most important thing what is the quality of the water of sure. the dialysis unit what is the quality of the dialysis is getting that is very important for us right uh, dr jaloka you had to say something yeah yeah i just want to expand this thing see the survival depends upon many other factors as well whether patient has diabetes whether patient has heart disease etc but if you want to see the evidence we had a published data where we compared the survival below 60 years and above 60 years mm-hmm. so there are patients who are, we also have patients who have survived more than 18 years but the average survival below 60 years was 8 years and above 60 years was 2 years so that is something which is published i can quote that sure so so therefore um, your your life expectancy or your your time that you have on dialysis really depend on some other things that are also very key i mean you've got an underlying controlled or uncontrolled diabetes your hypertension situation the probability of infections all of that kind of play together so while you have exceptional situations where people are going into their one and a half decade mark of uh, on being on dialysis those would be more the exceptions rather than the rule and so therefore as has been mentioned several times over the ideal should be to move towards and as early transplant as possible which gets us to a question here interesting one a theoretical one but worth um, considering given the audience that we given the expert panel that we have 
why has no medicine or injection like insulin for diabetics been discovered to revert the function of kidneys? It's an interesting question. Um, and, and, and that's why uh, Professor Balla and uh, Dr. Sampath, I mean, I just want to kind of bounce this off both of you. So your, your, your thing is on mute. See, kidney, kidney uh, functions are very diverse. And so you don't have a single stop uh, solution for uh, kidney disease. And you have a variety of uh, uh, kidney diseases. And the final uh, pathway is that all these people have very heightened levels of uh, protein uh, metabolic waste in their body and uh, their uh, water levels and their uh, salt levels go up. So it is uh, at present not possible to have a single uh, solution or a single drug for unlike uh, um, uh, diabetes where uh, the major problem is the deficiency of a single hormone. You can't um, uh, replace a major organ's function with a single drug. Right. Uh, Professor Balla? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> actually, when we are seeing chronic kidney disease and patient is in advanced renal failure, it is already an irreversible renal failure. And it is a fibrosis and sclerosis of the kidney. It is a diffuse global sclerosis of the I kidney, chronic interstitial fibrosis. So this fibrosis, there is no medicine so far available which can reverse this fibrosis. These kidneys are mostly contracted kidneys, scarred kidneys. So these medicines cannot change that pathology. It is not that if deficiency of insulin is there and you give insulin, if only one thing you can do is if kidney is producing erythropoietin, now you are giving erythropoietin from outside. If kidney is making a 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol, you are not able to make that, you are giving from outside. But urea and creatinine, these are the waste products of the protein metabolism, which kidneys are not able to excrete, and they are now uh, rising levels in the blood. So there is no way we can, uh, there is no treatment to improve the kidney functions or decrease this urea and creatinine levels. So uh, Dr. Sampath Kumar has already uh, highlighted this point that it, it is actually the irreversible pathology and that pathology, we don't, we don't have any treatment uh, to reverse this fibrosis or sclerosis. So, uh, so, so complication here, a question that's come twice now try to test different uh, sets of questions but both in the same area and i want to kind of address this to dr saha um people who have um they essentially complaining about pain pain in the hip area um without and pain in the track um on the, the on the flank um normal ckd patient um is this normal what should we be doing? Hello. Yes, much better, much better audio, sir. Yes. So your question was that back pain or loin pain? Acute pain in her bones around the hip area. And the other one is in the loins, again, both on uh, their, uh, on dialysis. You see, you see the pain in a dialysis patient can have multiple causes. It can be a disc disease. It can be a renal bone disease due to chronic kidney disease. So low calcium, high phosphorus. I think a lot of sounds are coming. Yeah, Allah is speaking on phone. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Yes, please. <laughs> so pain can be due to the renal osteodystrophy. It can be due to lumbar disc disease. It can be due to several other uh, causes where can be there can be myopathies. So unless we ascertain the cause for the pain, it is difficult to give a common prescription for the pain. Having said that, those who are CKD, we generally avoid use of NSAI painkiller to them. We give a paracetamol, which can be 500, 650 or 1000 milligram to once, twice or maximum three times daily, depending on the dose of the paracetamol we're using. And other uh, sort of maneuvers to control the pain, like physiotherapy, which is very important to control the pain. And of course, fundamentally, we need to do the calcium level, phosphorus level, the, their intact PTH level, vitamin D, vitamin D level, and try to normalize these to control the 
uh, uh, pain if possible. We must remember that in a diabetic patient, there can be neuropathic pain as well. And the management is a little different in that scenario. So for both of you who have asked this question about your pain, um, it would be useful for you to get in touch with your treating team um, to ascertain really the cause of pain if it's um, something that's got to do with the way your bone structure is being impacted or whether your underlying diabetes is something that is causing the triggering of your pain. It would be worthwhile to have that conversation with your treating team. It would be unfair for us to get into any specific discussions as also for can i can you... i come into for one more comment yes, which is not yes, related to the question of pain what i wanted to convey to the common people patients who are uh, hearing this uh, uh, webinar is that today we are in the era of self monitoring for any chronic disease self monitoring is the key to the success Sure. The way we said they say that diabetic patients should have a glucometer and check their sugar at home, that will probably answer your question, which you raised that whether we need a tighter control of sugar in a COVID era. Of course, we need a tighter control for many reasons, not necessarily that we can reverse their memory, metabolic memory, but we can, if we control the acuteness of the disease to some extent can be reduced. Simultaneously, we need a blood pressure home or blood pressure monitoring machine. And also I would add, we need a weighing machine for all CKD patients who are who can have a fluid overload, irrespective of their dial their on dialysis or not. Because if somebody is switching over from thrice a week to twice a week dialysis, by checking the body weight at the same time, one needs to understand whether the gain of weight is there or not. If the gain of weight is going too much, then the person needs to come to dialysis unit. So having a glucometer, a blood pressure machine at home automatic BP machines and a proper uh, wing machine are must for CKD patients for their self-care. At the cost of repetition, let me kind of uh, say this because this, this is useful advice for everyone. Um, make sure that you have a weighing machine that you can take your weight regularly at the same time so we know day on day weight gains or losses. Your blood sugar control should be monitored and please um, if it's possible, do not ration the use of your sticks. Make sure that you have a periodic um, uh, record of your blood sugar levels. That's very helpful for your treating um, team. And also uh, a good record of your blood pressure machine, uh, blood pressure uh, levels. For those of you that have asked the questions, I'm currently on five milligrams of Cardase or those that have said, I've got Telma 40, is it better than that? Or the others, there are many such questions that are there. Unfortunately, that those are not the kinds of questions that can be answered on a public forum like this because your treating physician is probably at the best is best position to answer that um, taking into account your recent blood pressure levels or your uh, weight gain levels or what your other blood parameters have been and so thank you so much for asking but, those many Bobby, questions uh, can, I, can, I, can i pin yes, it sir, up for this answer because this is very important and valid questions for from the audience yes because, sir. Uh, one controversy came about uh, two weeks before that uh, those who are getting this ac inhibitor cardis or angiotensin 2 receptor blocker so they are at a relatively higher risk. So this controversy came in general amongst the nephrologist or among the cardiologist also. So this was the real why this came. Actually, this virus, this COVID virus entering to the lung through AC, AC2 receptor. So this receptor, after taking this medicine, is likely that this there will be replication of this receptor. This receptor levels will go up. So there might be, this was one hypothetical question. But this had been cleared by several platforms, including Cranial Society of uh, Hypertension, different, all other platforms have cleared that those who are taking these medicines, they should continue these medicines. They have not advocated for stopping these medicines because if they are on this medicine, they are safer. There is no need to discontinue your medicine if your BP is well controlled with that. So that message should go to everyone. Right. So uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, if I have to summarize it and put it into plain language, please do not take any treatment modification decisions on your own. 
whatever drug you're on, whatever combinations you're on, they need to be continued on unless your treating physician or the team that is taking care of you modifies it. The only place where you have control is over reducing beyond the limits that your intake of water or of your other dietary um, components. Otherwise, in terms of prescribed drugs, do not make any modifications without consulting your treating team. And that, that should be very, very uh, loudly heard. The controversies that you will hear about ACE inhibitors or about such and such uh, treatment modalities, they are for a particular audience. And that audience comprises of people like the ones on your screen right now. They are the ones that are weighing out the pros and cons of one treatment modality over other, because these are, let's put it this way, new and challenging times. In the olden days, these conversations would not have been freely available to the lay public. But today, because of electronic media, because of the internet, much of our specialist communication is also open to you for reading. A cursory reading should not en enable you to make a decision that others have been training for for a long time. This is not to say that specialists are in a pedestal. Sure, have that conversation, but don't make that decision because you will not have the benefit of the experience that these folk have had over the years of training and of responsibility uh, that they have been discharging to each of you. So please be mindful. Do not start or stop any treatments without having the conversation with your treating team. Let me turn to some broad um, within the context of COVID. How do people protect themselves, especially those that know that they have got underlying renal disease, those that may have had their transplants, how do they generally protect themselves? Let me start with Dr. Santosh. What is it that is the, is, is, is the broadest set of prescriptions or, or guidelines that you would give to people who are living with renal disease in these days, particularly? So, uh, thank you for that question. So as we've been discussing and saying that uh, these patients may be at a higher risk of getting the infection and may have a, and may become sicker, they should be taking care of their health in a meticulous manner. That means, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing, not touching surfaces, wearing a mask when they go out, social distancing, all the measures that have been put out there and enforced by the government, all non-governmental organizations, medical and non-medical people, all that we've been asking people to do have to be meticulously uh, attended to. In fact, they should, after touching any surface, they should clean their hands with soap and water, preferably otherwise alcohol-based uh, solutions if they don't have access to soap and water immediately. Using the phones is a very important source of contamination. So if you touch a, a phone has to be wiped down after in the evening when we go back home, this applies to us as well, I guess. So the most important thing is that uh, they must keep themselves healthy. Now, is this a good time to discuss prophylaxis or? Just hang on a second. I mean, I just want to kind of ask this question. I'll follow up on that one. Um, uh, Dr. Santoshki says, wash, hand wash, hand wash, hand wash, hand wash. I am not going out of my house. I go out of my house only once a week for my transplant. The rest of the time I'm at home. I, the, the only people that are with me are my daughter and my son-in-law. And, and my grandchildren are also not with us. And so therefore, do I need to wash my hands all the time? Or is it only when I go out of the house? I mean, sorry, these are very, very practical yeah. questions because we say something and it gets interpreted differently. So what do you say? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I, I will not tell you the anecdotes I've heard. So uh, just to put it in real terms, if there is absolutely no contact with anybody outside and the people are all inside all the time, then hand washing may not be as useful but as you know people do go outside to buy things to buy vegetables like in our state vegetables are available between 7 to 10 and it's a melee out there during that time 
uh, we do not know what surfaces we come into contact with when we do there and most of the time it's incidental accidental we don't even notice it and when we come inside we must wash our hands before we touch any surface because that is a potential source for somebody else in the house so yes the patient may say i'm not going out people are not going out it's just one member of my family going out in the morning to buy something and coming back but that person has to be very very careful and because that person may miss out it's prudent for everyone to be careful yes it can be it can be taken to an extreme where it is not useful at all and people who are in the house and there is a for example uh, my parents in law were are indoors all the time they've been indoors they just not gone out but because of this law they were just washing their hands every time and we had a huge laugh when we heard it yes it can be taken to extremes but by and large i think it doesn't doesn't there's no harm in being more cautious than less yeah. right there's no harm in being more cautious than less uh, special case again i i just want to turn to dr mehul shah children i mean this is the time when children it is very hard as it is to kind of keep children at home they are supposed to go to schools and they are they 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 are active um how do you ensure or how do you kind of um, enable them to be at lesser risk particularly those that may have renal disease uh, i'm sorry can you please uh, repeat that the uh, children, children, not... children are a special case i mean uh, right. older people i mean they might err on the side of um, excessive hand washing and stuff like but children i mean you can't kind of get that to be happening so how do you kind of enable them i know what... i i think that that's something i think uh, uh, it should start right from an early age i i don't think uh, it should start at this point i know it, it's it's difficult because i think it's part of our culture and i think uh, certain healthy items uh, needs to be introduced uh, in every child's life right from an early age but right now having said that even though part of our society is little late in accepting this healthy measures i think children even uneducated children whom we have seen over the past two months they have realized the importance of hand washing wearing a mask and avoiding crowded places even those uh, who are from the uh, uh, underprivileged part of our society so i think it's just that repeated education of the children at the same time parents giving them an example if they keep on washing their hands on a regular basis and tell them what are the advantages of washing their hands and what are the risk of not washing their hands i think children do understand that then i think it's the uh, uh, regular and ongoing counseling of the children in a positive manner giving them encouragement when they have done good things and reminding them when they have missed something rather than reprimanding them i think it will help them over a period of uh, weeks to months and i think that's something i would like uh, 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 it to be continued post covid 19 as well so if if there's one good thing that might come out of uh... this covid thing apart from strengthening the health system apart from knowing that doctors are human beings that they need to be given the same respect whether it's a, a epidemic situation or when you see them as specialists do not kind of uh, be cruel to them particularly when they are putting themselves into situations of risk other than all of that hopefully we'll have better hygiene standards hopefully spitting will come down hopefully people will wash their hands hopefully we will have lesser numbers of diarrheal diseases because people are washing their hands and we have lesser numbers of transmissions of hepatitis hopefully all of this will happen and i hope that we are not going to lose this opportunity of setting those things but i want to come back to dr santosh you kind of twice asked this question and i stopped you both times what is it that we want to kind of get in by way of uh uh prevention or you were you were, you were using a specific word yeah so the reason is there is a lot of uh, talk about using certain drugs the anti malarial drug hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis and the jury is out as to how effective it is in fact some of the newer reports suggest that it may not be effective at all in fact it there may be side effects that uh, mitigate the risk and we should not really take it no so uh, it has to be the individual uh, treatment unit that offers it to its high risk patients that's one second it has to be the patient himself or herself who understands and then decides yes should i take it should i not take it should be informed consent there should be a baseline risk scoring there should be a baseline ecg and then 
the sure. for, so for let, the let, me, let me hold you there let, let, let me hold you there okay so people on facebook look let, just i mean about 10 minutes ago i said a lot of the specialist conversation is today available to you you type up anything in google it's available to you you are able to go on to the journals and you can read about all the stuff that people are talking about in fact why do you have to go to journals you can hear the president of the united states talk about stuff and you think that there is something that can be done by yourself and we are in a situation we live in a country where actually anybody can go to any pharmacy and ask for any drug and chances are you will be able to buy it in fact a lot of people have bought anti malarial drugs or have gone and written down the name and have stocked it up at home dr santosh is actually pointing out something very very critical and particularly for those with chronic disease especially liver or anything else please do not start any medication unless your doctor has prescribed it for you i'm saying that slowly so that we all understand that these are not medicines that you can pop and have no consequences this is not your supplement little bit of vitamin c lemon drink this is and that may be problematic for um, a certain class of people particularly those that are listening here they can have serious consequences and so therefore there is no prophylaxis that you can get on without a valid prescription please do not self treat and that's something that as iwc council we have been fairly aggressive about asking for stewardship in both the prescription from doctors and also the abuse of drugs from patients we have to have a good evidence base on with on which to actually put people on treatments and we also have to exercise responsibility as to what we pop into our mouths you might actually do something that was preventive you read it in the newspaper you heard it on the tv or you saw it on whatsapp and then you land up into difficulty and that's even more problematic for any one of our specialists here on this panel because then they not only have to deal with your underlying issue they have to take care of something that has been now man made and that is not a happy thing and so thank you so much dr satosh for actually pointing out that situation last comments from each of you and i have a minute for each of you uh, may i start with dr pankaj hans what do you think is going to be the future for people with chronic kidney disease who are on dialysis is there going to be some innovation that allows for dialysis to be both more cheaper and probably closer home first and foremost thing is that uh, preferably all dialysis students should switch over to using high flux dialysis that will remove more of cytokines and that will help these in this time actually the patients number 2 one has to learn to live with covid because covid is going to last and uh, just postponing transplantation so that the covid is over and then we'll, we'll have to wait for i think at least one year for covid to go away. so that is my message we should all learn to live with covid we should continue dialysis as it was being continued in pre covid era let there be no change but dialyzer definitely needs to be modified as per the removal of the cytokines is more with the high flux dialyzer right uh, dr bhat on mute myself please yep yeah, uh, you know uh, uh, as uh, my predecessor said it is not going to go away very quickly it's going to take time and we have to modify ourselves we we all we all gone into a shell slowly we'll open up uh, we will have to entertain outpatients slowly there should be a balance between our video consults and the outpatient consults we will have to maintain social distancing everywhere in our dialysis units in our outpatients everywhere and that is going to last for many months so hopefully in about 3 or 4 months we'll get a hang of things and then people will start restarting their transplant programs which have all been put to halt as of now except for the cadaveric which you know with a lot of uh, caveats we may be able to do uh, so you know the 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 good uh, 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 things that we're going to learn now which is social distancing hand hygiene uh, you know wearing the masks um, you know good communication between patients uh, carers and the doctors all these things have to go on 
for quite some time thank you uh, dr lalit yeah my take is you know it's uh, it's very difficult to i mean i i think of three scenarios basically one is whether we can eliminate this virus from the surface of earth which is very difficult which is seems to be next to impossible second scenario is if we develop some medicines or vaccine against this virus third scenario is the virus attacks us depending upon our immunity who survive who develops immunity kind of you know ultimately virus attacking the human kind and developing immunity i mean darwin theory and theory sure. of evolution so fittest will survive and there will be natural selection <laughs> so uh, hopefully my take is that in next 6 months to a years time possibly there will be a vaccine available and sure. some more effective medicines may be available by which we can conquer this dread, deadly virus right dr shishir gam re and feelings that have been expressed already and uh, i feel that uh, eventually we will have as as everybody has said learn to live with it and not to fear it and we have already started making modifications in our dialysis unit in the transplant opds and other places and uh, patients are also learning more about it and i think we will overcome uh, historically every 100 years or 50 years we do get problems but as a human race uh, we are more silent and i'm sure i'm more that we will overcome and i'm sure our patients will also be able to get through this tira and get back to their lives that we all want to do thank you uh, dr saha now we can't hear you yes hello yeah i should not lose non covid patients we should not decrease the frequency of dialysis thinking that they may get covid they may not get covid they may die of inadequate dialysis we should start restart transplant with due protocol and precautions the protocol we should go to the universal precaution mode and one you know whatsapp joke what i would like to mention here that we must add our nose and mouth as our private parts and cover them protect them do not expose them in public right another thing i would comment that what salman khan says that jo dar gaya wo bach gaya so precaution is important protection is important but work should go on should go on in a modified way otherwise we are going to lose more non covid patients than covid right dr mohanty this scenario this is the opportunity uh, uh, india is a resource less uh, low resource uh, country and uh, we cannot provide dialysis to each and every patient and uh, every dialysis patient has to learn how to uh, life with less number of dialysis so it's a, a diet control salt control and water control and they have to relearn uh, this technique how to control because many of them are very uh, uncontrolled they uh, get lot of uh, weight gain and these things and and this is opportunity to relearn how to live with less dialysis right dr jaloka uh, so a couple of things uh, about innovations we are having innovations in all uh, forms of treatment including dialysis and transplant i wanted to mention about the artificial kidney and wearable kidney which are being experimented in america and Uh, this yeah. is hold on to that i'll come back to that because i want sure. to you know ask that question that, that, that's one, one okay, that's fine. so those are something i wanted to tell about innovation and about covid 19 see my worry and warning is that we have moved forward to module 2 now we should not during phasing out of this lockdown move back to module 1 and start misbehaving the way we used to because now our uh, life has moved forward we should maintain this same hygiene and care what everyone has discussed so as to prevent infection that is what i worries me we should not go back when the lockdown is phased out sure and i'll come back to you uh, dr mehul sir uh, similar to what uh, tarun has just mentioned i think 
problem uh, makes us uh, think different. I think whatever gains which we have had, there has been a major loss all over the world. But the gains of uh, continuing the measures, that's one thing. Second thing is the uh, telecommunication, uh, teleconsultation. I think that's something that should gradually increase because we will realize that at least about 20% of our patients, all our patients can be managed with telecommunications or teleconsultations. And the third thing is just uh, off the track, uh, we need to talk about why did this pandemic start? Meaning, how did it all start from uh, Wuhan? I think uh, we try to show our supremacy over the uh, other uh, uh, creatures on the uh, in, uh, on this planet. And I think we need to give a thought as to why did this all start? I think, and that's something I'll leave the audience to think about. Sure, Dr. Naran Prasad. Yeah, actually, you and everyone understands on this earth that uh, human beings are this uh, the highest, uh, uh, most intelligent brain. And uh, they cannot get rid of anything, and including this pandemic also. So my guess is there that in next one month, we will be able to get rid of this pandemic. And uh, as far as concern of the non-COVID patients, recent just uh, in next two, three weeks, we will have the availability of, uh, we will have uh, the IgG test for against this uh, virus. And uh, we can just determine some of us or some of our patients is out of this danger. They have already developed immunity against this antibody and uh, against this virus. And then they, that would be the safe. Uh, still, right. I. I say if any emergency operation is there, if your patient is RT-PCR negative, they are IgG positives, then you can think of this patient is the best patients to go for any kind of the surgery. So even in this period of the crisis, we are in the positions to take the decision on any kind of the emergency surgery. If your RT-PCR is negative, your IgG M antibody whether this is there or not, if IgG M antibody, this is all going to evolve in the next two, three weeks. And that is already in the pipeline. Rapid antibody test is already available here. Right. RT-PCR is being validated in the next two hours. In only two, two hours time, you would have like the gene expert test, you would have the test like that will say you that probably this patient is having this RNA or not. So these right. kind of things will evolve. And uh, we'll get rid of this uh, pandemic. And I think uh, I'm wishing all the best to all this human race. <laughs> right. Dr. Sampath, very quickly. Yeah. See, there was one uh, discussion which is missing. That is the role of home dialysis, the peritoneal dialysis. I think these are the times at which we need to just innovate and also push certain uh, patients who are coming from far off, patient, far off uh, regions uh, to have uh, peritoneal dialysis as a good form of dialysis, uh, home-based therapy. And in fact, uh, they are less um, uh, open to the uh, problems of uh, traveling. And in fact, there was a, a suggestion from uh, the epidemiological point of view in South Korea that out of uh, the 100% uh, 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 patients who got uh, COVID from dialysis units, there are no patients uh, from home-based dialysis units. That is, peritoneal dialysis patients sure. did not, not even a single uh, patient uh, developed uh, uh, COVID uh, in their uh, country. So this is a very important lesson that home-based therapy can be given uh, Philip in these times of uh, difficulty. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Dr. Balla? This virus is going to stay here. So now we have to make social distancing, hygiene, sanitization, and this as our uh, incorporate in our lifestyle. The good part is that our infections are going to be, other infections are going to be less in dialysis units used to otherwise because every technician, every nurse is wearing a mask now. Every patient is now wearing the mask. So there is there are good points also. The other infections, bacterial infections, internal jugular, uh, central venous tetral, fistula related infections are going to be definitely less now that we are already, already seen in our unit. Now, second is telemedicine. Now you realize that a lot of patients are just coming for wasting money, coming from a distance, which is not required actually. 
especially stable transplant patients you need not come the, uh, require them to come so frequently and waste so much of money so tele medicine is going to come in a big way that this virus is going to change our day to day practice it will affect our practice for next generations to come because this virus is not going to uh, go away soon this right uh, habit of spitting it was so common in our country so now this is going to change there in mask queue management we are in india we are not in the habit of uh, staying in a queue like in us or other countries so this has to be there now another is that our practices will change that is that is the one sentence i want to say our practice will change it it will not continue the way we cannot have central acs in our hospitals the we were enjoying the rear now you have to have open windows you have to have cross ventilation that is very important think from that point of view all our hospitals are corporate hospitals are now central acs without negative pressure without hepa filters if one patient in one room can infect the whole of the hospital so these practices have to change now thank you right thank you so much dr balla i mean all of you have kind of said that things have to change i have kept three people for my last set of comments and i stopped somebody from actually speaking in the earlier thing and this is where i want to kind of bring in dr raka dr santosh and dr tarun i'm looking forward i mean there is i mean since you kind of already used the words i'm going to kind of ask i mean there is this whole thing of artificial kidneys or acceleration towards um safer earlier um transplants and then what else lies ahead the three of you i mean yes there's the doom and gloom at this point in time many things will have to change and we'll have to change it for good what is lying ahead uh, who wants to start dr tarun since you had started already okay. speaking go ahead so yeah. see the kidney as earlier uh, some some somebody mentioned is a very complex or very complex organ so engineering this artificial kidney is equally difficult that is going on for a decade now or more than a decade but now the results have started coming up so people are on trials now it's in very early stage but then in forthcoming i don't know whether i'll see this in my lifetime or not but i am very positive and optimistic that one day artificial kidney is going to come and it is going to revolutionize the treatment of kidney failure that is one part so it's dr. very santosh complex, very complex dr dr santosh what is it that you're looking forward to so uh like uh, dr tarun said we all the time when we were studying for our exams we had this question about artificial kidney we all are looking forward to a time when we are no longer dependent on what we thought of was inevitable for example we all thought that injectable erythropoietin diapoietin sera were necessary now there is oral forms available so things are changing things will change we will have better forms of therapy what is most uh, adaptable to the human body there are will be forms of dialysis which you walk around with there are forms of uh, treatments well not, may not be like insulin for diabetes but much better than having a say a 5 foot tall machine that we have to get hooked on to thrice a week so yes in all the things there is always hope for new innovations that will come up and i think it is that artificial kidneys and is very artificial other forms of dialysis were spot on and we can look forward to that dr laka we can't hear you yes can you hear me now yes yeah. Yeah, so I said, like Dr. Tarun said, I'm also quite optimistic that eventually, some years down the line, or maybe a few decades, we will definitely, definitely have a wearable kidney. But another thing which I think uh, would be of help to kidney patients would be more specific immunosuppressants if we can develop them. Immunosuppressants which give us adequate immunosuppression without making the patient more infection prone, just prevent rejections without. for uh, making the patient prone to infections so i think a lot of work is going on in this field and that would be of a great help to patients if we can develop more specific immunosuppressants i have one more question for you dr raka in the future will we see a 50 50 distribution of men and women nephrologists and transplant specialists <laughs> on a panel like this oh yes definitely i think ever since i passed out i have seen so many female nephrologists and the years are actually progressively increasing in our pgi chandigarh this year three females have joined as a faculty so i think um, maybe another two years we will see some distribution 
female sort number male nephrologist yeah even as it is and uh, now it is going to happen in happen india happen in also. india also yes because it is a stated policy from the integrated health and wellness uh, council programs that we will yeah. have at least half of our panels to be women and we fail consistently and no, now i think the numbers are increasing yeah is that we will get to a place where our healthcare specialty areas will be equally represented by women as much as by men yeah. i hope yeah. the facebook audience has had a good 120 minutes of a conversation with our esteemed panelists before i hand over to kamal for his closing remarks just want to kind of pinpoint a couple of things do not take your treatment into your hands that may not help your doctors or your treating team let them give you the advice if you need to get them on whatsapp get them on the apps of your particular hospital get them on the phone they are more than available and aware of the difficulties right now there if there needs to be a reduction in your frequency of uh, dialysis it is something that would have been advised to you be sure that you are then taking care of your diet and your fluid intake make sure that you are watching your weight and ensuring that your urine output is good if you are able to monitor your blood pressure and your uh, blood sugar levels at home brilliant please keep a record because that's incredibly helpful for your treating team if you find yourself in difficulty if there is acute pain if there is something that is out of the ordinary for you do not hesitate to call do not wait for the next day just make that call your treating physician may be at a bet much better position to make a judgment call as to whether you go into the hospital or not whatever be the situation around you hand washing helps personal hygiene and improved distancing not the social distancing but physical distancing will improve social solidarity has to increase if only that increases then only we will protect one another by keeping a little bit of distance among ourselves and with that i thank you for being with us and my personal thank you to each of you uh, specialists who have taken your valuable time to be with us come all over to you for your closing remarks so thank you so much uh, all the experts for your uh, really enlightening session uh, it was a wonderful 120 minutes of uh, uh, you know information guidance and a lot of tips for our uh, audience who was watching on facebook we had around uh, 3000 people watching live uh, mm. this session and i believe this is going to be increased a lot when people are going to watch it again and again on facebook to get this kind of information uh, a broad informs you know uh, themes which you will all uh, put forward is that our enhanced hygiene uh, practices will help us uh, stay more healthy in future uh, your your advocacy and your push for home based cure and management uh, home based dialysis will definitely uh, you know lead uh, forward a certain uh, breakthrough and uh, a new uh, you know focus by the people by the healthcare practitioners and a lot of push on telemedicine i i believe all of you are available for your patients through various mode and, and doctors in general would be more uh, open to use the technology to be available to their patients and guide them uh, during covid on beyond and the changes in healthcare infra which uh, you know you highlighted is also something which need to be further discussed about and we at ISW council will definitely look forward to take these for the discussions forward i thank you all of you again we had a uh, uh, you know doctors from all across the country and i believe uh, patients from uh, various uh, part of our uh, nation would have been able to connect with their doctors thank you so much our gratitude for you for uh, audience do join us for our uh, upcoming experts uh, panel sessions on care on pcod and infertility on thursday april 23 at the same time and rheumatoid uh, arthritis friday 24 uh, we will also be hosting a wide ranging discussion on 
uh, you know, with industry captains, government leadership, and healthcare experts on how to mitigate the damage by coronavirus disease on lives and livelihood. Uh, at our second edition of Coronavirus India Live on Monday, 27th April. So thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to see you again. Thank you. <laughs>